Sarah Blaffer Hurdy earned her doctorate in anthropology at Harvard in 1975 for her pioneering work on the social life of langurs in India, a study that shed new light on infanticide in primates and saw sex from the viewpoint of both genders. She's the author of five books, including The Woman That Never Evolved, which redressed the then tendency to ignore the competitive and assertive nature of female sexuality, Mother Nature, which explored the evolution of history of maternal behavior, uh, and more recently, Mothers and Others, The Evolutionary Origins of Mutual Understanding, which explores the idea of cooperative rearing in human societies. It's been the uh, Times, it, it's been Book of the Week in the Times Higher Education Supplement, had a terrific three-page review recently in the TLS, uh, and it was chosen as Book of the Week by US The Week. Um, she also uh, is Professor Emerita at uh, the University of California at Davis, and lives on her farm in Northern California where she and her husband grow the most exquisite walnuts, which I strongly recommend, um, <laughs> and which attract flocks of wild turkeys in the dawn to feed on them. Uh, Sarah Hurdy. Uh, I'm suffering from laryngitis, so I wanna make sure everyone Here's me if I get too far from the mic, make a noise. The irony of this situation is not lost on me. Just as women gain a voice in evolutionary theorizing, <laughs> this woman loses hers. But I'm honored, honored to be here, and I will do my best. All right. Darwin's was an inspired guess when he proposed that Africa was formerly inhabited by extinct apes resembling today's gorillas and chimpanzees, and he hypothesized that our ancestors evolved from such creatures. We now know that the line leading to uh, Homo sapiens. Was there a pointer that was here? No, so it does not. Lo you know where it is. The line leading to Homo sapiens split off from. There was a pencil of someone's. I hope I didn't lose it, but it's all right. It doesn't matter. I'll just point. Um, split off around seven million years ago, which is why today the. DNA sequences of humans are 98% similar to those of chimpanzees and bonobos. And broad cognitive similarities are also there, which is why this specially trained chimpanzee in Japan actually tests better than graduate students at remembering the sequence of ordered numerals that are just briefly flashed up on the computer screen. When, but they are differences. Darwin stressed the commonality of life, which is absolutely profoundly correct. But what I'm going to be stressing today are the differences between humans and their closest ape relations. When Michael Tomasello and his team at the Max Planck Institute for Evolutionary Anthropology in Leipzig used a special battery of sociocognitive tests to look at differences between 106 chimpanzees 32 orangutans, and 105 two-and-a-half-year-old children, they found that in terms of spatial ability and object permanence, in terms of understanding quantities, many versus few, in terms of causality, what happens when you poke something with a stick, humans, chimpanzees, and orangutans all tested in about the same range where they found 
the biggest differences were in the social domain, in terms of social learning, learning by watching a demonstrator solve a problem, in terms of communication, pointing at something, and in terms of theory of mind, understanding what someone else was intending or feeling. Humans, of course, also, from a very early age, are distinguished by how readily, voluntarily, and eagerly they share with one another. Such hypersocial or other regarding impulses are what provide the building blocks for cooperation. Now, it is true that other apes, chimpanzees, and bonobos do indeed sometimes help one another, occasionally share food, but in general they tend to do so only after being begged or solicited. Um, and the sharing often is much closer to scrounging or tolerated theft than the very considered and, vo and volunteered gift giving that anthropologists document for every human society. Now, why do humans differ so much from other apes in these respects? Well, we used to think we knew. Um, oh, just, just a reminder of how much we benefit from being able to read intentions. These Kayapo tribesmen have waded waist deep into water and they're beating that plant, that timbo plant in the water in order to release toxins that stun the fish so that women and children can wade in and gather up the fish in the basket. So with no more than this Stone Age technology, humans have access to this abundant food source which is not available to other apes. We gain tremendous benefits from our capacity to cooperate. So why just us? Well, we used to think we knew the answer. Um, humans, we assumed, have to be born with special capacities, maybe having to do with our big brains, uh, being able to imitate others. And it was assumed that this neurocognitive machinery of imitation lies at the origins of peculiarly human capacities for empathy and developing a theory of mind. But the recent discovery that newborn chimpanzees as well can make, can imitate funny faces, along with the realization that even small-brained monkeys like macaques have mirror neurons, suggests that the basic wiring for identifying with others is present in other primates as well. And the big difference has to do with what comes later over the course of development. As human babies become more and more interested in monitoring, imitating, and engaging others, and in seeking to understand what they are thinking and feeling, this quest for intersubjective engagement, Whereas little chimpanzees, after an initial burst of enthusiasm, around 12 weeks or so, just lose interest in this stuff. So why are humans so much more other regarding than other apes? Darwin had proposed that a tribe, including many members who were always ready to give aid to each other and to sacrifice themselves for the common good would be victorious over most other tribes. And this idea that we needed in-group solidarity in order to defend against outsiders has become the explanation of choice for humankind's peculiarly pro-social natures, often mentioned without discussion of any alternative 
alternative factors or possibilities. Recent essays in science, uh, the new scientists, or this one not long ago in nature, stress that altruism's midwife must have been conflict between groups and that generosity and solidarity towards one's own may have emerged only in combination with hostility towards outsiders. Proponents of this interdemic conflict hypothesis compare the murderous mutual loathing between tribes to the genocidal urges of chimpanzees, and they take for granted that our ancestors spent the last millions of years uh, engaged in this chronic warfare. But there's some problems with this if we want to explain the initial origins of pro-social impulses and how we diverged from other apes in this respect. First of all, proponents um, tend to stress that, the, that there's this chronic early warfare. In fact, we, we don't have a whole lot of evidence until the last 15, 20,000 years or so when certainly evidence abounds. I mean, we have the, the bloody history here is bloody clear, um, but we don't know what was going on earlier. Uh, that's a problem. But even if humans and chimpanzees did share a common legacy of chronic warfare, and even if pro-social tendencies could evolve from passing through a crucible of genocide and selective group extinctions, we still need to explain why the arguably even more dominance-prone, more aggressive ancestors of chimpanzees, also, as we know from Richard Wrangham's work, Lethal Raiders, why they didn't spend the last seven million years evolving these pro-social traits with their obvious usefulness. No one doubts that outside enemies enhance in-group solidarity. Social psychologists have known this since the 1950s. Darwin suspected it. But if we are interested in the initial emergence of hypo, hypersocial tendencies, in this one line of apes, by itself, intergroup conflict is not a very satisfying explanation. And it leads me to ask whether our pre-human ancestors confronted a more pressing Darwinian challenge than avoiding being wiped out by their neighbors. Perhaps they confronted a different kind of natural selection pressure, rearing offspring that survived. By 1.8 million years ago, the African branch of Homo erectus, sometimes referred to as Homo ergaster, were beginning to evolve larger brains, larger body size, and to mature slightly more slowly than other apes. And the price tag for rearing these youngsters was beginning to creep up to the 13 million or so calories that it takes today for a foraging mother to rear her child, far more than a mother by herself could provide, especially since new babies were likely to be born before the previous children were self-sufficient. Now, none of us has a machine to go back in time and observe how children were reared in the Pleistocene, but based on information from still extant hunter-gatherers, the average three to four year interval between births is much shorter than the four and a half to eight year intervals found in other apes. And this is so even though humans are born bigger and take longer to mature. So how can this be? Well, the answer, of course, is allomaternal provisioning, provisioning by group members other 
than the mother. And in other apes, infants once weaned provision themselves. But human children remain dependent on others for years. Even with help from her mate, the vagaries of hunting are such that a Pleistocene father would not always have been able to meet the needs of children who asked to eat regularly, several times a day. Without alloparental as well as parental care and provisioning, our ancestors could not have produced young that survive, so that even early hominins must have evolved as obligate cooperative breeders, that is with both alloparental shared care and alloparental provisionings. Now, since Darwin, there has grown up a robust body of theory to explain why alloparents, group members other than genetic parents, find it advantageous to care for and provision someone else's young. And Randy Nessie kind of gave you a brief preview, too, of where some of those explanations lie. Unfortunately, all I have time for today, though, is to remind you that cooperative breeding has evolved multiple times in social insects. It characterizes 9% of some 10,000 species of birds and occurs in perhaps 3% of 5,400 species of mammals. Cooperative breeding is especially well represented among social carnivores, like these African wild dogs, where pack members will come back from the hunt with pre-digested meat in their stomachs, which they very cordially regurgitate into the mouth of waiting pups, sometimes provisioning the mother as well with this attractive formula. Highly efficient, voracious predators will routinely defer to helpless pups, permitting them privileged access to carcasses. Alloparental provisioning buffers slow maturing offspring from starvation, permitting long periods of post-weaning, or in the case of birds, post-fledging, dependence, and in humans, of course, we call this childhood. Even though no ape other than humans exhibits shared care of newborns, in fact, shared care has evolved many times among prosimians and monkeys. In more than half of the nearly 400 species in this highly social primate order, mothers readily tolerate other group members taking and carrying around their new infants. Allo mothers are attracted to babies and eager to do so. Any of you who saw the recent studies of in humans of both mothers and also non-mothers who have the pleasure centers of their brains go off when they're looking at the pictures of, of new babies that are healthy and in good shape. It's probably very similar to the response of these infant-sharing primates to a very gorgeously and flamboyantly colored natal coat of a baby. Um, in more than 20% of primates, it's actually close to a quarter of all primates, shared care is accompanied by at least minimal alloparental provisioning, even though the provisioning might be nothing more than a mother occasionally sucking, suckling another infant, another mother's baby. Only among humans, and in the subfamily Calatricidae, these marmosets and tamarins, do we find extensive provisioning where alloparents will voluntarily deliver preferred foods to babies. Among these tamarins, mothers routinely 
give birth to twins. Her mate carries them all the time, except when they're being suckling, suckled, most of the time anyway. And other group members will hunt for beetles and frogs, small prey items, to bring to the babies, especially during this weaning period when they're most vulnerable. Some species of tamarins, infants are getting 90% of their solid food from these gifts from aloe parents. But as genteel as this kind of sharing sounds, it's important to keep in mind that cooperative breeding does not mean that everybody is cooperative all the time. A lot of competition goes on, particularly over access to the babysitters. To maintain her monopoly on caretakers, a pregnant marmoset may kill a rival's young, even if the rival is her own daughter. This is the grandmother from hell. <laughs> Faced with insufficient allomaternal assistance, tamarins and humans also exhibit a distinctively unprimate-like trait. These cooperatively breeding primates are the only ones known to respond to a lack of alloparental assistance by abandoning their young right at birth. Other primates don't routinely do that. And calatricids and humans are also the only primates where mothers are known to actually physically harm their own offspring. Um, this is the dark side of cooperative breeding. Mothers who lack social support have a very contingent maternal commitment that may simply not come on tap. Another big similarity between humans and these distantly related tiny-brained South American marmosets and tamarins is the high level of maternal tolerance towards others taking their babies. By contrast, in all other apes except humans, uh, like this chimpanzee mother, mothers remain in continuous, intimate, skin-to-skin -skin contact with their babies 100% of the day, 100% of the night, this mother will not be out of her touch with her infant for even a single moment for the first six months of the baby's life. Mothers out there, think of what that would be like. This orangutan mother will continue to nurse her baby as long as eight years. And unfortunately, poachers know this. If you want to catch a little baby primate ape to sell in the market, you have to first shoot the mother because you're not going to get it otherwise. Their dedication is total. She's the baby's sole source of warmth, locomotion, and nutrition. Unique among apes, humans are remarkably tolerant about allowing others postpartum to hold their infants. Right after birth, this newborn infant's mother, who's given birth slightly outside of camp, comes back in, hands the baby to his grandmother, who's shaping the skull, surrounded by other people. Similar among the Hadza, Nicholas Burton Jones tells us that the new baby is likely to be surrounded by relatives, carried by them, held by others 85% of the time in the period right after birth. Uh, ditto for other foragers. Among these FA, Central African foragers, babies are held by five to 24 different aloe mothers, averaging 14, held by them 39% of the time right after birth, up to 60% of time in successive months. And the FA babies with the most aloe mothers at age one are those most likely to be alive at age three. Who are these aloe mothers? Mostly their kin. Male aloe mothers are mostly fathers, brothers, cousins, Grandfather's surprisingly little going there. Female aloe mothers are mostly sisters, aunts, 
and grandmothers. Clearly, the luck of the demographic draw, just which kin are alive, still good at finding food, not encumbered with young of their own, this is going to be very important. Luckiest of all are going to be the immatures with two dedicated parents, an assortment of allo parents, uncles, aunts, older siblings, and if fortunate enough, having a still productive and surviving grandmother. And I know we'll hear more about this on Thursday from Kristen Hawks. Fortunately for our species, flexibility and mobility were hallmarks of forager families. People moved away from adversity, they gravitated towards opportunity, and the opportunities there often included access to alum maternal assistance or the chance to give alum maternal assistance to needy kin. A growing body of literature supports hypothesized links between alum maternal assistance child survival, and maternal reproductive success. Now, for those of you wondering why, if allo parents were as essential as what I'm telling you, how is it possible that no one noticed this before? The answer, I think, has to do with the fact that until very recently, detailed studies of child rearing and child development were all done in low mortality, post-industrial, Western populations. In the developed world today, fewer than 2% of babies die in childhood. However, child mortality rates are far higher in the developing world without access to clean water and medical care. And routinely, 30 to 60% of children die before they grow up. Similar mortality rates are typical of wild, non-human primate populations and almost certainly pertained in the Pleistocene as well. Last year, when Rebecca Sear and Ruth Mace reviewed available evidence for 45 traditional human societies, all of them still characterized by fairly high rates of infant mortality, they found that alloparents do indeed have a significant impact on child survival. As you might expect, the mother has the greatest impact. Uh, fathers, however, can be critically important in some contexts, matter remarkably little in others, depending on local subsistence ecology, and also on who else is around to help. The most reliable, the most consistently beneficial allo parents were grandmothers and older siblings. By now then, the demographic implications of alloparental care and provisioning are so well documented um, that I think we can take it as granted that our ancestors evolved as cooperative breeders. That really was sort of what I ended up concluding in an earlier book, Mother Nature, so that in this new book, Mothers and Others, what I was considering was the cognitive and the emotional implications for an ape growing up dependent on multiple others. I've been particularly interested in what information from sociobiology, neuroscience, psychology, and the emerging field of comparative infant development, and we heard some about that yesterday, can tell us about how such an unape-like mode of child rearing affects traits like mutual tolerance, perspective taking, and social learning. I have time for only a few highlights here. Even without taking child survival into account, because these were studies in contemporary Western populations, what we know is that the presence of a maternal grandmother in the house is correlated with increased maternal sensitivity to infant needs, greater infant security in the mother-infant attachment just by the presence of the grandmother, and enhanced cognitive ability by age four. 
presence of older siblings is correlated with more sophisticated theory of mind by age three. Indeed, Ruffman and Perner quipped, theory of mind is contagious. You catch it from your older siblings and other older caretakers. Improved social skills at uh, older ages then, and finally, multiple caretakers is correlated with enhanced capacities to integrate multiple perspectives from more than one person, a point that ties in very nicely with Ben Bradley's talk yesterday about babies in groups and how this affects development. He was thinking about babies with a father in addition to mother. Here we're talking about babies with a complement of both parental and alloparental caretakers. Turning now to comparative data from other primates, Mark Hauser at Harvard using tamarins and Judith Burkhardt at the University of Zurich studying marmosets have both done lovely studies showing how these cooperatively breeding primates are far readier to pull a rope that delivers food to another monkey in an adjacent cage than chimpanzees are in comparable tests. Trained chimpanzees will do this, but they don't just rush to do it with the eagerness of these marmosets. These generous other regarding impulses come into play even if the other individual is not a relative. And in the wild as well, cooperatively breeding tamarins are unusually tolerant, and food sharing and provisioning spills over into other realms like volunteering information. Adult marmosets will routinely vocalize to immatures to call their attention to novel or particularly palatable food items, and then they'll intervene to prevent them from eating something toxic, some novel food that's poisonous. So join me in a thought experiment. I want you to take a primate with the cognitive and manipulative potentials, the rudimentary empathy and theory of mind that we're learning does indeed exist in all great apes, absolutely confirming Darwin's suspicions about this kinship, and then rear that creature in a novel developmental context where maternal care is contingent and where the infant must depend on care and provisioning from multiple caretakers. The resulting phenotype, as this infant develops in this novel developmental context, is going to be more adept at perspective taking, far more so than a chimpanzee. Then subject this novel phenotype to a novel set of selection pressures such that infants best at monitoring the mental and emotional states of others and also best at learning from them are going to be the best cared for and the best fed. And then what do you get? Darwinian selection favoring traits like enhanced mutual tolerance. You need mutual tolerance to have social learning. You need eagerness to give to others, to have something that comes close to teaching, enhancing further social learning, enhanced social communication, enhanced perspective taking. These are precisely the traits that the comparisons between humans and other apes require us to explain. So in conclusion, I'm not suggesting that Darwin's early hunch that has been so widely picked up today to the exclusion of some of, other, of Darwin's other early hunches that have been alluded to today and yesterday about compassion and sympathy, uh, that this early hunch about intergroup conflict, I'm not saying that that's wrong. We know that an outside enemy increases in group solidarity. But did that come first? Is that what explains these peculiarly pro-social impulses? Um, 
What concerns me is that by focusing so exclusively on overt intergroup conflict, we overlook occupations such as child rearing that are at least as important, and in my opinion, more important, for explaining selection pressures favoring the initial emergence of these peculiarly prosocial traits in our species. And if, as I propose, apes interested in the mental and emotional states of others evolved as byproducts of cooperative breeding, this means that long before the evolution of behaviorally modern humans, capable of language and symbolic thought within maybe the last 100,000 years, and even before the evolution of big-brained, anatomically modern humans within perhaps the last 200,000 years, emotionally modern humans questing for intersubjective engagement with others were already on the scene. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah, very much for that tremendous talk. Um, Randy is going to write a, a paper on miraculous and timely recovery from laryngitis um, uh, uh, in, in a uh, brilliant speaker. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we're a few minutes early, of which I'm inordinately proud, and we will therefore go straight to coffee and be back here at 11.15 for our discussant panel.